All right. Well, you have your Bible. Just put it up if you would. Amen. Say, this is my Bible. I believe that it is the incorruptible word of the living God. And today, it will go into my spirit, into my mind, into my emotions, and into my body, conforming me to the image of Jesus Christ. Boy, you sound good. Praise God. Amen. Glory to God. Uh, go with me to Matthew 14 to start out. We've been sharing about relationships, covenant. You know, covenant starts in your family, spouses, with your children, with your mom and dad, with, you know, uh, with, and then it should flow to the body of Christ. And sometimes that's easier said than done in that the enemy, wherever there's a primary vehicle of God, he will always strategize to attack. Just like in a, in a war, you, you attack the supply lines, the communication systems. And the enemy will do his best to come against each of us in different areas of our lives and the context of relationship, especially regarding trust. And uh, uh, when the Lord told me uh, how, how to do this, you know, to enter into the really the glory of God, our end, our uh, vision it is just for the glory of God. We're going to be doing a lot of teaching on the glory of God. But before that, God said, teach on the love of God and then teach on relationships. So I had this message planned a while ago. And uh, it fits in now because we're talking about covenant. And when you're talking about intimacy with God, uh, intimacy of relationship with uh, one another, uh, the enemy will always try to, to come up because he has strategized. I don't know of anybody that's not been hurt. He always comes against the area of, of being able to trust, being able just to really uh, have freedom relationally. And, but that's what God wants. You know, a lot of people want the gifts of the Spirit, and rightfully so. But the key to the gifts of the Spirit is love for one another. Amen? 1 Corinthians 12 tells you what the gifts are. 1 Corinthians 14 tells you how they operate. The 1 Corinthians 13 is really the glue that, that holds them together. It's, it's the love of God. So there are people who want to see the power of God, the gifts of the Spirit, and that's wonderful. But the key, again, is simply love for one another. When you have a love for somebody, then you have a need for them to be blessed, to be made whole, especially in their time of need. And so God is really, I believe, in, in these last days, he's really shoring up the church in the context of relationship to where there's a love for one another that flows so strongly. Because the enemy tries to come in there in any type of relationship, whether it's between you and God, uh, you and your spouse, you and your children, you and your parents, you and the body of Christ, he'll try to come in, obviously. So we're going to enter into some things to see how, we, how far we get today. And uh, I believe as a teaching, it'll be very practical, and it'll really help us to, to enter into some things. All right, Matthew 14, uh, you know, we've gone over this story a lot where you know, uh, Jesus is walking on the water. And uh, let's start with verse uh, 27. Uh, Jesus said, be of good cheer, as I do not be afraid. Peter answered and said, Lord, if it be thou, you bid me to come out on the water. And Jesus said, come. Well, it was an unusual request and really a response that a lot of people would uh, think to be atypical. And, uh, but Jesus was blessed by that request. So Peter says, let me come out and walk on the water. Wow, that's strong stuff. And Jesus said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. And I want you to see something. A lot of people, and I know myself as well, and I stood in vision, you know, uh, Jesus and the apostles on this little boat, like this little canoe, you know what I'm saying? And it, 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 was, it, it was a ship. It was a ship. I mean, it had at least 13 men on it. And it had to be so big that Jesus was in the hinder part of the ship when that storm came. They had to go get him. So what I want you to see is Peter was in the ship, and then he had to walk on that ship. And any one of those men could have joined him, but for whatever reason, they didn't. But it says that uh, Peter came down out of the ship, walked on the water to go to Jesus. 
But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand, called him and said unto him, O thou little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Glory to God. And uh, they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying of a truth, Thou art the Son of God. Amen. All right, let's start there. What I want us to see and understand is that, first of all, Peter was just like each of us. Amen. And uh, he had hang-ups, he had weaknesses, probably was not the most likely uh, to succeed in his class. Amen. And uh, yet he had great intimacy with God. And it was just a great man of God. I mean, entered in, he, he, had to go, he went through some stuff. I mean, denied Jesus three times, denied the vision in Acts 10 because he was afraid of what people would think. I mean, uh, he had weaknesses. But yet, I mean, his very shadow ended up healing people and raised uh, Dorcas from the dead and on and on. And what's important, I think, to see in this passage is this. He became afraid. But the key is why. First of all, we need to understand God wants us free from fear. He really does. And I think fear is one of the greatest uh, men. The things that Job feared came upon him. Fear really is a breeding ground for uh, destruction. Uh, you know, a lot of times we understand that, you know, go out and rob a bank, that's bad. But to God, fear, it's not a good thing. In Luke 21, 34, Jesus puts fear with uh, drunkenness and sexual sin. It's crazy. He said, when I come back, he said, uh, will there be faith on the earth? And he says, uh, there's going to be fear. There's going to be uh, great sin. And, and, you know, and he puts them together. And it is like unforgiveness. You know, unforgiveness is a big deal. And uh, I didn't used to think that. I didn't think, even, I'm again, seeing the word of God, man, Jesus said it's something that's really not a good deal at all. So, but he began to fear. And if you look at the root, why? Well, he saw the wind boisterous, the lightning, the rain. And it wasn't just any rain, it was a heavy rain. How many know that Satan will try to come when you endeavor to walk on the water? Amen? When you try to step out, amen, he will try to come. I mean, there's giants in the land. I mean, when Jesus in Mark 5 was passing over to deliver the demoniac of Gadara, I mean, he came, didn't he, with a great storm. He'll try to rain on your parade, so to speak. But, you know, he has a right to contest his land. There's a balance of that. But he doesn't have a right to touch you. But uh, he will try to intimidate. He will try to, you know, uh, keep you from getting to the other side. Amen? I had someone tell me one time when I was, they said, well, if you had faith that, you know, there wouldn't be any rain or any storm or whatever. And I thought, son, you haven't been far. You know what I'm saying? Jesus, you know, encountered storm. Uh, but he said, peace be still. Amen. So he, he was fearful. And, and the reason is quite obvious. I mean, why is fearful? He was a seasoned fisherman. I'm sure he knew of a number of people that died in those waters. And uh, he correlated the wind, the storm, the rain, the lightning with being hurt. So there was Jesus in front of him, amen, and his eyes were on Jesus. As long as his eyes were on Jesus, he was focused on him. He was walking on the water, amen. So that shows you, amen, that it's not by our strength, but by the strength that comes, that emanates from Jesus. But when he took his eyes off of Jesus... What began to happen is, obviously, he began to sink. But the, the key is why. I, and I, that's what I want to hit today. Relationally, uh, you know, there are more people not in church than in church that are Christians. And 90% of the people not in church are people, be quite honest, they got offended by somebody that is a Christian. Pastor, whatever. And some of those people are strong, you know, that they know God. And, and, it's, and it's a shame. And you always get this thing. And I think Rita and I were talking outside church, you know, well, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Well, you know, you don't have to, uh, you know, stop at the gas pump to be a car. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but you won't go very far. The, the bottom line is this. Peter had in his mind, he had something that, you know what? 
someone died, he knew probably knew a number of people died under those circumstances. So the circumstances at that time became greater than looking at Jesus. We're going to look at something today. We'll see how far we get called the cornerstone principle. And it's a very powerful principle. It's a cornerstone principle. And the cornerstone, it's what your plumb line. It's what everything gravitates towards. It's the key to how you perceive things. And uh, we're going to look, look into a lot of strong examples along that line. But what happens is this. There are things that register on us, either good or bad, that after they register can have a great influence on our lives. Okay? Uh, let me get, I could get, I have a lot of examples here. But uh, let me just give you this example. Uh, I was ministering not that long ago, to uh, a family, a wife and three children, they were in their teens, of a pastor. Uh, the, the husband was a good man. I mean, he was a righteous guy. And uh, they just got, I mean, I, they sold, I bet, for 15 years this church. Good church, good pastor. And I, someone gave him some money. They had about a quarter million dollars. Man, they're just about ready to break grounds. And I think like six weeks before they're going to break ground, this guy who was like, I don't think he was like 50, entered into a bad relationship with a girl who was like 19. And I think it lasted for like three weeks, or maybe like four weeks. And uh, long story short, the church is, man, bang, this went down. And, uh, but the church was good. They said, you know, we have mercy. Get restored. We have an interim pastor. Come back. And I counseled the kids. They were, they were great. The dad was good to them all the time. So that, they were great. The wife was great. So long story short, he goes through a time of restoration and, and he's ready to come back. And, and he just said, I can't. He said, I can't. And, and I, I knew he, had, he was actually at the, in, so everybody in the church elders tried to convince them they couldn't. And they said, well, go. They actually paid for a vacation for him. And he went down really to Hawaii where there, there's a youth with a mission base down there. And uh, so he was down there, and nobody knew the deal. He went down, and, and somebody prophetically put a, while he was out, you know, in his room, put a message saying, God's forgiven, you're restored, it's time to enter back in the ministry. Never, never met this guy in your life. And, uh, and I talked to him afterwards a little bit, because he knew I, I helped with his family. So I appreciate that. And I said, well, because he was doing insurance or something now. And uh, I said, man, I, you know, your wife told me about that deal down in Hawaii. He said, yeah, but he said, I'll never I'll go back. And I, I said, here's the deal. Here's what happened. His cornerstone is condemnation. He thinks it's humility. But see, that's his cornerstone. So everything he does, he sees in the light of what he did in that experience. And, I mean, he messes up, which we miss up. I mean, you know, you don't wake up on time. You yell at your somebody, you know what I'm saying? So he sees himself, no matter what happened, God comes to him in worship. It's amazing to forgive him, to help him, uh, to refresh him, to strengthen him. But, and it's good, but he always, the cornerstone is always that sin that he committed. And, I mean, it's been years now, and he's never been free from that. Now nah, he's a good man, goes to church somewhere, good dad, good husband. I mean, but he's never been free. See, that experience imprinted itself on his soul, not his spirit. And that's become his cornerstone. You understand what I'm saying? Now, likewise, you can have something, a, a good imprint. I call it solical imprints. And then, uh, you know, we're talking you're, as a cornerstone. I had, uh, I, I gave you an example, Tia Osborne and his wife, their, their grandson, man, just got into drugs big time. And uh, it was just a mess for a number of years. I mean, early age was 16, 17, 18, 19. Well, they come back to the Lord in their early 20s. The wife was a drug addict. He was a drug addict. And, uh, and I've heard his testimony. He was ministering up here, not that, oh, a couple years ago. And, uh, but here's the deal. Here's what's neat. All growing up, I mean, he had good parents, and he'd sit on uh, T.L. Osborne's lap. I mean, how do you like to have grandpa like T.L. Osborne? You know, and his, you know, and his wife, Daisy. 
Daisy's gone to be with the Lord, but TL's still around. I mean, he, you know, based out of Tulsa. And uh, long story short is that, I mean, T, for those of you who don't know, T.L. Osborne, one of my best friends is a real close covenant partner with him. And he put a, together a book in his letter, you know, a few years ago of miracles. And it's volumes. I mean, like, like 100,000 miracles. Kathy, one of her favorite books is what he wrote on his book on healing. But amazing. And a lot of people give him credit for introducing mass evangelism when they're in India. They had 300 people blind in, in a second. I'll see. But anyway, so, so this young man, uh, I mean, growing up, he just hears about the love of Jesus, love of Jesus, love of Jesus. Miracles, miracles, miracles. Love, power. You know, I, that's the deal. So here's what's neat. Even though he went off on the deep end, so to speak, and, uh, and, and was a drug addict for a while, him and his wife, I mean, they come back to the Lord. His cornerstone is the love of Jesus. His cornerstone is, and, and he doesn't know any better. He, he's just free. Now, here's an interesting. The pastor that I talked to you about, who's a good man, he's not free. He's blessed right now. He's free to a degree, but he's not fully free. See, God wants you and I fully free. And so he has a negative cornerstone through these negative solical imprints. And, but these guys, him and his wife, they went on a mission trip. When Tia Osborne and Daisy Osborne are your grandparents, you go on mission trips, okay? And uh, I mean, they'd only been restored. You know, they come back Lord, about a year, less than a year, a little less than a year, and they're ministering in, I, I believe it's South America, at an orphanage. And uh, all these kids, none of them had ever heard or spoke. They pray. And every kid in this orphanage can hear and speak. I, I think there's about 50 kids. So they come back, and a lot of people in the church are mad. They're mad. How could God use them when, you know, they were drug addicts nine months earlier? Well, bottom line is they didn't know any better. I guess Jesus didn't know any better. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. But see, they're free. They are free because their cornerstone, amen, is forgiveness. And this is what Jesus does. You don't have to be a superhero to enter in to doing these works. Glory to God. So what happens is, glory to God, they, they, you know, it's a different deal. Amen? So what's this have to do with us? Well, in all of our lives, man, we've had things imprinted on us, some good, some bad. And what happens is, they can either dominate our lives, or we can get free. In Luke chapter 4, I, I, you know, we've heard this priest probably a hundred times at least. You know, the spirit, where Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Let, let's go there if you, we would. Luke chapter 4, uh, let's start with verse 17. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, and we had opened the book and found the place where it was. Well, in verse 16 it says, as was his custom, he did this. So he did this almost all wherever he went. You know, uh, glory to God. He found the book, uh, uh, Isaiah, in chapter 61, and, and, he, and then he just, he declared what the word said. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind and set at liberty them that are bruised. The Amplified says those who are down, downtrodden with calamity and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Here, now, these certainly are a job description really of any believer today because Jesus said we'll do the same works he did. And so it's very powerful in, in the context of what we're to believe for uh, ministerially. But I, I think that somehow we missed it in regards to uh, there's also an order here. This is a type of how the believer enters into being free. And you know what? You're dangerous when you're free. Really. You're dangerous when you're free to the devil. As long as you got something back in your mind, the calamity might happen to you because you've been hurt before. Uh, as long as you have in the back of your mind that, that sin you committed, you might do again. As long as you have in the back of your mind that, uh, you know, just that which isn't good, you're not free. God's called us to be free. Amen? Glory to God. So, but there's a, there's a, I believe there's an order here. The first, obviously, is salvation. 
He anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. The reason it says to the poor is back in those days, the poor were considered, they were ostracized because they judged by outward appearance. If you were poor, you were simply not favored by God. You know what I'm saying? Back then, that's the context of Mark 10, you know, where, uh, you know, the apostles were amazed when Jesus said, it's difficult for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God because they believed in outward appearance. I mean, they always struggle with that. John 7, 24 says that. So, all right. So you get born again and that's wonderful. Amen. That's what it's about. But the next step is where there's hurt, you got to get healed. You know, you can be saved and still not free. Amen. You can be saved and still not be healed. What's it mean to be broken hearted? That means, man, that, that you just got devastated. You know, I, I just wrote down a few things on how you can get, uh, you know, get broken hearted. You can get, uh, you know, from loss. Man, a loss of a mom or dad through divorce or early death, the degradation. You know, get bu- from bullied. I, I mean, I, I was ministering to a guy that wasn't free. He was a well-known businessman in a certain area. And uh, I just went up to him one day because I, I knew him somewhat. And I said, I know you're Christian. But I said, man, you're one of the meanest men in the world. <laughs> you're one of the meanest men I ever met. Seriously. And I said, man, what's up with that? And uh, finally, you know, first he got kind of smart with me. And then he said, all right. He said, when I was in uh, third grade, I got beat up every day on the school bus. Now, when I talked to this guy, he was about 60. So thinking about that, eight years old, to six, that's 52 years. And he said, ma'am, he said, I, I've been angry at people ever since. And it shows in his marriage and with his kids, you know. And it's like, and, and, and he has, has a couple hundred employees. Uh, and it shows. And, he, and I said, well, so for 52, see, he got imprinted. Through the hurt, the people are, are bad. That you can't trust people. And he said, I made a vow that I would never let anybody hurt me again. Well, you see, not a good deal. But you see, he, he really he had a broken heart from what happened to him. And uh, anyways, God helped him. And he, he really has changed a lot, praise God. And uh, has helped a lot of people, especially his Wife and kids, praise God. But uh, being second best, man, there's a lot of I'm amazed. Uh, seriously, and I know parents are imperfect. I was at a church in, in East Pittsburgh, Penn Hills, a while ago. And it was a very liberal denomination, Church of Christ. But this pastor was born again. Anyways, I, and I, I was teaching on, you know, Revelation of Abba. And, and I, I just, you know, I said with every hand, every head bowed, if you've really been treated second best, I mean, loved second best. Like my parent, I said, put up your I mean, half the people put up their hands, and every one of the elders did. And Jesus began to move. It's a, I, I don't get that one, seriously. I, and I really don't get that, but it's prevalent. You may be betrayed in, in different ways by friends, infidelity in a marriage, used wrongly, failure, misperceived, past sin. Maybe you hurt somebody. And man, you're brokenhearted because you hurt somebody. You've been hurt. Sexual abuse. It can be a, a hundred different things. And, uh, but here's the deal. A lot of times in the church, it's just like, okay, I'm born again. Everything's changed. Well, it has to a degree. But I'm, I'm here to tell you, it's just like in a marriage. Here's what's amazing. When you get married, God joins your spirits together. You got to work on your soul. Amen? Anybody figure that out? If you haven't, you haven't been far. You know what I'm saying? And when you get saved, your spirit gets saved. But the Bible says in the book of James... That your soul is in the process of getting saved through the engrafted word. Amen? See, what happens a lot is that because people get saved, and then a lot of times they are criticized for needing help with their soul. Well, bless God, you're saved. You don't have to deal with that past sin when, you know, you, you beat up those people and the guy's still in, you know, in a hospital. Well, no, you, you got to, there's certain things that are done, but certain things you got to deal with. And uh, so what happens is, you know, there, there is a progression. You know, usually when you've been hurt, it's first you enter into denial. And guys are especially good at this, for real. Honestly, you know, women, they will tell it like it is. Guys usually, you know, it's like we'll go into denial hoping that it will go away. Amen? And, and that's the truth, isn't it? And sometimes it does. And that just validates more denial. And uh, 
But we're just like, you know, God will take care of it. You know, I told you this story, but, you know, with my, my one daughter, Debbie, playing basketball. She's a good basketball player. She started, she's playing some varsity in 10th grade. And uh, she hurt her finger. We went and got an x-ray down in Butler. And doctor says, I got good, bad news and good news. Bad news is your finger's broke. Good news is that you can still play. Well, we got in the car and I'm really happy, you know? And here's a girl, you're blonde here, blue eyed girl, pretty girl. And she's considering, you know, she's thinking about the prom and having a broken finger. And I'm saying, what's wrong? <laughs> I'm saying, you can play. She reminds me of that quite a bit. <laughs> and uh, she played. But, uh, you know, seriously, but you can enter. How, any Christians in denial? See, they, you know, everybody's told this is going to happen in your life. You get prophesied over this, this, and this. And prophecy is amazing. But prophecy conveys your potential. It doesn't mean that it's going to come to pass unless you enter into doing what you need to do. I tell people all the time, don't marry somebody because you heard them prophesied over. Marry them when you start seeing the fruits in their lives. But the bottom line is this. You know, how many Christians you know are in denial? Man, there are more Christians I know that are disillusioned. And denial, this, seriously, I think I know many Christians that smoke weed that I do on un- unbelievers. I'll just tell you straight up. Why? Because I can't deal with this. I was just minister. I, oh, man, I wish we had more time. Boy, this, there are times like this. And you're glad that we don't have a building. Amen. <laughs> but, uh, but I was ministering to a guy. He's not from around here. He's from uh, out West Oregon. So I can share a little bit. But, man, I, I, you know, they were visiting. The wife was originally from here. And she said, can you minister to my husband? He's a Christian, but he's smoking weed with my son. I said, all right, all right. I said, and I just... I have little tolerance for certain things. I have little tolerance for pornography, little, to- little tolerance for stuff like that. So I'm being nice. You know how you have to be, right? And, uh, and he's like, well, you know, it's no big deal. Jesus has given us this. And, you know, it's like, really? You know, and uh, type of thing. And finally, he was a guy that just never grew up. Good business. Just never grew up, man. And finally, I said, you know, in the Bible, you know, God changed people's names, man. And, you know, Saul to Paul, Abram to Abraham, Sarah to Sarah. He said, yeah, I know that. I said, man, I see God's given you a name. I, I, his, I won't say his real name. And I said, he said, what? I said, Peter Pan. I said, man, because you never grew up. I, I looked at me like that. And I said, sometimes God gives you liberty. Sometimes you take some liberties that God doesn't give you. But, uh, but anyways, I felt good about that. Amen. And uh, his wife said, boy, he would come back. And his, you know, because sometimes people think when they're going to a pat, you know, they're going to get some religious stuff. But I said, man, you need to grow up. You need to grow up. But anyways, I don't know how we got on that. But denial, that's how we got on there. But then next step, a lot of time you get out, you go from denial to, a lot of people just stay in denial. A lot of people, then you go to anger. How many, know, how many know some angry Christians? Whew, man, they're angry. Why? Because they don't feel God is treating them right. They've been unjustly treated. And they have been unjust, but they've never been healed. They've never been healed. So they wonder why. You know, so what happens, you can usually tell if someone's in this, in this stuff by the way that certain things can set them off. I'll never forget, when we first started the church, we had a house group, and I was, I was uh, preaching on a, a verse, I, th- I preached on it for like three months, didn't I? Do not, I the scripture says that those who love the Lord and walk by his word will not be offended. After three months, like six people got offended and left the church. You know, but <laughs> at least I was in the spirit when I presented. But I remember one lady who loved the Lord there, I mean, you know, you bring brownies and stuff and, you know, to the, uh, you know, to the house group. And, and one lady brought some good brownies. And, and there was a young Christian girl there. And she said, man, these are good brownies. She said, you know, could I have your recipe? And this lady says, no. She's like, I'm thinking, whoa, what's up with that? And she just walks away. Well, see, it's because she got unjustly treated in a former church. She was manipulated, not a good deal, but she's never healed. And her past, big time unjustly treated. See, to the degree something affects you, okay, can get to you is usually indicative that there has not been full healing. Amen. So denial, anger, depression, uh, usually go from now to anger to depression to trying to do something. And, uh, but some people stick in one of these things. Again, how many Christians you know that love God, that struggle with depression? Man, good Christians. And then uh, a lot of times people just try to do things on their own. Amen? Make it happen. That's not God. All right. Now, I said all that to say this, that Jesus wants us to enter into a place whereby, oh God, we enter into having a good cornerstone. And, And I'll be honest with you. In our humanness, 
It's amazing how bad imprints a lot of times will be re more readily received than good imprints. I've shared this many times. Uh, Kim Clement, a, a really great prophet, uh, you know, just good guy. Many of you know of his ministry. He shared this many, uh, different times. You know, I've been at services where I mean, I've seen him, I mean, like 10 people straight. He just tell you their first name, last name, your doctor's name, and what was wrong with you with great results. But man, there's times where he misses it. And I forget, he said, uh, man, he went to this guy and he said, you know what? Uh, you have an Uncle George and this happened, you have this, and you have an Aunt Mary, and you have this and, and that and, and this, and, and, and you know, and this is your doctor. And the guy says, you know what? Uh, I don't have an Uncle George or Aunt Mary. And Kim says, well, you should have or something left. <laughs> but, you know, but he said, here's what's amazing. He says, a hundred times he's got things right. He said, every time he goes to minister, without, every, every time, you know what comes to his mind? Uncle George and Aunt Mary. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? That's our humanness. Amen. And, and, but God has provision, praise God. All right. There, but there, I can, you know, a lot of examples we could get enter into. But for time's sake, let's just enter into, start to enter into provision. One, we need to be honest with God and say, okay. But see, the order of God, I didn't even get through the whole thing. One, in Luke 4, you get born again. God binds up your broken heart. Then deliverance comes. Man, someone's struggling with anger. Someone's struggling with unforgiveness. Someone's struggling with impurity. Then you see deliverance comes. I mean, if you still haven't been healed, you see, deliverance can't come, but the word of God is salvation, brokenhearted, healed, then deliverance. Then what happens is, you know, blessing and physical wholeness. And then lastly, you being in a place where you proclaim daily, man, the, the day of Jubilee, the year of the Lord, and it's an awesome thing. All right. So I know I'm going over a lot of stuff, but you can get the CD or DVD or whatever. So when we get honest with God and say there's still some hurts there, okay? Now, there's a balance. You know, you don't go back. You have to go back in every area of your life where you were yelled at or someone raised your voice. You got to get wholeness. But there's things that you know that, that impact you that you need to deal with. And then you ask God to wash you. Amen? Through his word, Ephesians 5 says he washes us through his word. Glory to God. That he might have a glorious church. Praise God. Mm. He washes us through his word. You begin to see his heart, his love for you. Oh, glory to God. Mm. You know, maybe you, you weren't, someone was loved second best. And you begin to see through the word of God that, man, what he went through on, you know, and regarding redemption. I don't know how many of you ever saw The Passion, the, 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 the movie. Man, it, that's strong, isn't it, man? You know, I'm, it, I'm myself, I, when he was being whipped, you know, because that was a, a large part of the movie. And the skin was off his back. And, and that wasn't even half of it. Really, I mean, it was worse than that. But it was like, but you read the word, 1 Peter 2.24, by the straps. You, know, you begin to see the price he paid. And what happens, you begin to get washed through the word of scriptures like that from being loved second best. You don't deny things, glory to God, but you enter in the being washed. And that's an awesome thing. Glory to God. Then you're washed, praise God, by his presence, by experience. You're washed by his presence. Man, I, I mean, there's things that are taught and then there's things that are caught. You're washed by his presence. Glory to Jesus, man. I was ministering to somebody they had survivor's guilt. Man, they were uh, in a car and the car got hit from behind. Their little brother got killed. And this guy, man, he was on drugs for real. He wasn't, he's was a Christian. He was on drugs for like 18 years. I never met, I, and someone said, you know, can you talk to this guy? I could talk to him. But man, only Jesus, only Jesus. I don't care what degrees you have. I don't care how good you think you're God. It doesn't matter. Only Jesus. I mean, it's fine. You want to play just like worship. You want to play skillfully to the Lord. You do what you can. But I'll tell you what, you're talking to someone's face to face like that. And all your hope is that Jesus will come and they'll open up their hearts. Because they don't know up their heart, it doesn't matter if Jesus comes. And I, I just said, man, I don't know what to tell you, man. Except that I care about, I don't, I've never met you. 
And in this case, you know, I, 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 just, I just begin to weep with him. It's good, see, when brothers and sisters weep with you, it'll change you. And I never met this guy before, but I said, I don't know if you understand it. He wasn't even, he was a believer, you know, but nominal, if that's possible. Anyways, but as a believer, and uh, I just began to weep. I mean, for a while, like five, six, seven minutes. And he began to weep. Sometimes it's good to weep. Sometimes it's good to laugh. And uh, God helped him. And uh, for the first time, God, God, only God, only God can heal. Physically, emotionally, only God. And you know what? He started to come out of it gradually. And he wasn't from around this area, but I got him connected with a good church, good worship, man. He said, I got in the word, and man, he said, every time in the worship, I get helped. Amen. What was happening? He was getting washed and refreshed. Amen. Praise God. The voice of God. Man, the, the voice. The voice of God isn't there to say, man, you know what? You missed it again. I'll tell you one more time and you're out, right? No, the voice of God, you know, he comes and says, you know what? Hey, you just need to get back in the scriptures. Look at me. Amen. Like Peter. The voice of God says, man, I, I've had different people have been hurt, sexual abuse, and, and, and God came to him and said, you know, I was there. And there's certain reasons about things. He said, I was, you know, and, and they see the hurt in him. It's, it's, it's amazing. And what happens, you get washed. I, I mean, God, see, it's, it, it's neat to see God work. Uh, I was working with a girl in counseling, real smart girl. She was working on her doctorate. And, uh, man, she had been hurt. I won't get into all, hurt lots. And, and, and she was uh, raised in a Christian house. And, uh, man, we just, you know, so my wife and I helped her a little bit. And, and I began to talk to her, and I said, well, let's just, spirit of refreshing, God wants to heal your broken heart. And it's a true story. God, uh, I may have shared this before, but she had a real expensive fish, like $30. I don't know what kind of fish it was. And right after we talked, the fish died. That, that doesn't sound good, you know. God, you say God wants you blessed, and then you go home and your fish is dead, right? But uh, she said, Lord, I, I believe in the spirit of refreshing. You heal my broken heart. And, and uh, she, she had to take off somewhere. And, uh, and she said, Lord, just help my fish. She come back. That, now, when she left, that fish was belly up. I mean, it was not doing good, okay? And she come back, and that fish was just swimming away. Someone said, you telling me that Jesus resurrected a fish? That's exactly what I'm telling you. Why did he do it? I, it changed her life. I'm serious. It changed her life. She's an amazing person, her and her husband now. But uh, amen. Uh, I'm going to pick on Ruth a little bit. You know, Ruth had a tough upbringing with all, what, nine, ten kids or whatever, kind of tough dad. And, you know, so, you know, so Ruth's gone through a little bit. And, you know, I, I was always telling Ruth, you know, you're the great... She, how many of you like Ruth? She's just, she's just good. Amen. But every, they raise their hands quicker for you probably than me. Amen. I'll tell you what. It's just a good deal. So, you know, she, Ruth's just a good person. So I kept telling Ruth, you know, that you're just a great lady. Great, great, great. Just not a good, you know, you're a good lady. Just not, you know. And what was the deal? You went to that lady's house to help her out that was sick, your neighbor. And Ruth's not buying into it 100% because she had some, you know, cornerstones 100%. And what happened? A parrot comes down to you, Right? A parrot and says, You're a good lady. You're a good lady. Isn't that amazing? She comes and then now she said she's set free. I told her it's amazing. The pastor tells you you're a good lady, you don't believe him. Parrot tells you you're a good lady, and she's free. Amen. <laughs> I, you know, it just uh, it just, just changed fivefold ministry. You know, apostle, prophet, parrot, you know, and, you know, type of thing, evangelist teacher. And it's like, but you know, but isn't that neat? God is so good. He loves her so much that he orchestrated. That parrot to come. Amen? To minister. I, I tell you, God is so good. Praise God. Amen. See, that, that parrot's so good. You can probably, amen. Replace your pastor with him. But he can't teach as good. As, don't do it because he can't teach as good as me. All right? Amen. <laughs> Praise God. But what happens is you enter into a place where wrong imprints, wrong cornerstones are broken, and God puts in new ones. And, uh, and, and I'm sharing this in the context of relationship. Because, again, imperfect people, I mean, really, we're all under construction. We all say stupid things at times, do some stupid stuff, no matter how good-hearted you are in our humanness. And we have to be in a place where we're free enough. If someone offends you, you know, you love them, amen, and you're not affected. You, you, God wants us in a place, praise God, that 
You see the body of Christ as good. You see the body of Christ as he sees the body of Christ. Amen? You know, I'm amazed when John 17, last words of Jesus, he said, you know, I really appreciate, Father, the men that you've given me. I've been glorified in them. It's like, whoa. It's like, these are the same guys that I'm reading about. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, and these are the same guys, man, right before that, you know, arguing who's going to sit on his right and left and who's the greatest. But Jesus saw their heart. So the cornerstone, Jesus saw their hearts, right? Rather than seeing their weaknesses. And can you imagine if Jesus, can you imagine if the weaknesses of the apostles registered as a cornerstone on, on Jesus for real? I mean, he's probably thinking, I, Father, I know you want me to sin, but I need to spend a few more days with these guys. You know what I'm saying? For real. It's amazing. I mean, when you read in the book of Matthew, right before the Great Commission, it says that some of them there, right before he ascended, doubted. They doubted it was him. I mean, who did they think it was? You know what I'm saying? Really? That was amazing. But you see, the cornerstone was he believed in these guys because he saw their hearts. So I want to really encourage you. I know, you know that uh, I know this is a lot in one time. We'll see what God leads in. But God wants you uh, to really enter into a place where you say, God, anything that causes me not to be free, negate that imprint, that cornerstone, and give me the cornerstone that, you, that I need in this place. Praise God. Through the word, through, his, through your presence, through your voice, and through the body of Christ. Glory to God. And you know what? Just like Ed said today to start out in testimony. God will do what you need him to do. Amen? Isn't that good? And there are times, I know honestly, we all need refreshed. I don't know about you, I need refreshed. And that to me, church needs to be a place of refreshing. There's always going to be times, yeah, there's some things need to be corrected, exhortation. But overall, church should be a place of refreshing. Honestly. I mean, when the Pensacola revival was going out, it was all about holiness, which is good. But man, it was, I had one uh, lady come to my wife and I, to Kathy and I and say, you know what? I get beat up at church every day. And it was like, it's like, well, why would you go back? You know? yeah. and it's like, it's like, why would you want to get beat up? And it's like, I get beat up enough. By, you know, I get in the boxing match, don't get beat up, but I'm in enough battle with the enemy. I don't need beat up when I go to church. I need refreshed. And you know, when the Holy Ghost came on you, he said, you got two new, you have new lungs and glory to God. That's, that's God. And, and I really, the Holy Ghost just, man, that was strong stuff. Man, I just, man, I, and I've seen it happen many times, like in Catherine Coleman services, etc. cetera. And, uh, but that's a wonderful thing. So as we close, I, don't let the devil get your goat. Don't let your past determine your future. And especially in the body of Christ, you know, what we're emphasizing now. You know, uh, there's always going to be people, hurt people, hurt people. And there's hurt people in the body of Christ. But you don't let them determine your joy level, determine who you are. But I just feel in relationships in general today, God just wants you to be free and, and, and uh, enter into a place where, uh, whew, I'll save this till later. But uh, anyways, uh, some different things, but God wants us to be free. Amen? And again, it could be your past. It could be a lot of things. But like with Peter, Peter's a great guy. He's a great guy, but he was human just like you and I. And man, uh, the things you get imprinted with they're for real they're for real man you know the slap by dad is a different than a a slap on the playground when you get you know by, by a peer and those things register but if i can say one thing as we close god loves us so much that he comes big to bind up our broken hearts and the way he does that is through the power of his grace man the power of his love you know, through his word, his presence, it's an awesome thing. I mean, he, he comes, I mean, in a powerful way. He just doesn't, I mean, he comes big. And uh, so let's just receive that right now. And just, you know, between you and Lord, if there's something God says, you know, maybe you've been offended or hurt big time by someone in the body of Christ. Just, uh, just say, God, erase that, help me. And just begin to wash that in Jesus' name. And, uh, or whatever it is, praise God. So Jesus can be your cornerstone. Amen. There's things in our lives that uh, we need Jesus to come. We need him to be savior. Amen. The healer of our broken hearts. The deliverer. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Our healer. 
And, and, and glory, the one, the, the God of decree that enables us to decree that it's finished and victory's here. So let's just let the Lord minister us right now, okay? Father, we just give you praise in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you, God, for, uh, Lord, you didn't, you said you knew about the, the waster in Isaiah 54 that's come to hurt, harm. But God, you said that you would take care of it. And God, all of us have had, uh, been imprinted wrongly in different ways. And God, we just receive in Jesus' name that you'll set us free. And God, help us right now. Just to, just to receive the spirit of wholeness, restoration. And Lord God, we just give you praise. You know the end from the beginning. And Father, we really do thank you for your order. It's of course salvation first. But Lord, you really understand our soul. And you really, you desire our soul to be whole as much as our spirit. Lord, that's 1 Thessalonians 5.23. And Lord God, we just give you praise. Just like you're the savior of our spirit, you're the healer of our souls. And Lord, you want us to be free. And then Lord, we just lose that spirit of freedom right now. Lord, I sense it right now. We just thank you for it and loose it in Jesus' name. We give you the glory, honor, and praise. You're so concerned about us. You said you desire us to prosper and, and, and to be in health even as our soul prospers. And uh, we thank you. You're, you're, you're that type of God. And Lord, we just give you praise and glory and honor. Thank you, Lord, for just the flow of your anointing right now over each of us, inside of us. And uh, we just give you praise, God, that we're not bound. We're not bound by bad experiences. And it's, Lord, a lot of times, Lord God, people didn't even know what they were doing. They really didn't. And so, Lord God, it's about that. And our battle's not against flesh and blood, but against the enemy. But God, we just give you praise for the spirit of freedom. And in Jesus' name, Lord, where we may hurt somebody else, somebody hurt us, whatever. We thank you, God, for the spirit of freedom. Thank you, Lord. We're not bound. We're loosed. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Why does sense God so strongly? Amen. Well, he's just here. And you're good ground. Hallelujah. Ooh, man, alive. I just sense Jesus. Glory to God. Man, well, I guess we got to end. Praise God. Mary, I'm going to call on you. You back there. Hey, tap her on the show. I'm going to ask you to close us in prayer, okay? I'm going to ask her, Mary to close us in prayer. And when she does, if someone else needs prayer, just come on up. Amen. Praise God. But we just want to, uh, again, aren't you glad for the gospel? Really? It's gut level. Amen. Some vegetables today, but amen. You got to eat some vegetables and, you know, and uh, next Sunday will be a little bit more of uh, vegetables. No, no. It'll be this maybe a little bit more mashed potatoes and gravy, but glory to God. This is good. Amen. Because God wants us free. And you know, the world really, can I tell you something? You know, well, the world's in denial for real. That's why Colorado said the greatest boost to their economy has been legalizing marijuana. At the same time, they have more kids jumping out of windows, being thrown, and, and, and everything else. But uh, the world's in denial, man. The world's in anger. I mean, they're killing each other. The world's in depression. And if someone needs Prozac or something, hey, I'm, uh, you know, that's fine. But I'm going to tell you something. The number one prescribed drug in America is Prozac, for real. And that God can help us. The world, the world, that's where they're at. And the world, the best, so to speak, of the world or those who are trying to make it right on their own. But how many know you can't? Amen? Only Jesus can make it right for you. Only Jesus can bind up our broken hearts and set us free. So amen. All right, Mary, if you'd close some prayer, and then just, just, just give someone a hug and tell them that, amen, they're, you know, they're loosed and blessed in Jesus' name. But anyone needs prayer, just come on up, okay? Amen. Thank you, Lord, so much.